Thanks. Uh, so welcome back. <coughs> uh, here is the plan for today. So basically, I'm going to discuss 200, well, not very much related things. The first is just to give you more details on convergence of observables. So last time, I just said, OK, there are theorems on convergence of, say, expectations of spin field in discrete to continuous quantities. Expectations of product of densities of correlation functions of energy densities to some other quantities. So I'm going to comment more on that, both <coughs> on uh, how the statements are proven, and, uh, but maybe even more importantly, on how one should think about the limits. So what appears in the limit is uh, what is called correlation function of some conformal field theory, known under the name the Ising conformal field theory. So I just want to spend maybe 20 minutes on discussing this. And also there is a simple exercise in this direction uh, in, the, in the exercise sheet number three. And the second topic for today <coughs> is more in spirit of what Mariana told about. So remember, right now we are stuck in the setup of Pfizer radial graphs. So that's the basic picture, I mean, the, the, the underlying lattice on which I'm working. And uh, there is a question, what is beyond? Is it just an ultimate class of lattices on which one can prove convergence results or not? Uh, an analogy to keep in mind for the second part of the talk is the following. So imagine you are interested, that's again about random walks. Imagine that you are studying random walks on some refining graphs, like there are maybe periodic even graphs and you study random walks on them. So the very, so, so there is no randomness that's not random environment, that's just deterministic periodic graph. And the very first thing you want to prove is that uh, the random walk converges to the Brownian motion. Okay, <coughs> so two comments. First, to prove such a theorem, you should slightly care about how you embed the fundamental domain. Because, okay, nobody guarantees that the covariance matrix of the limit is just the identity matrix. It might be skewed a bit, right? So you should somehow find the conform proper conformal models of the fundamental domain. And the second comment, so that, that was a kind of a warning. And positive news are that, of course, you can do it whatever the graph was. So whatever periodic graph was, you can prove such a theorem. And there is a geometric way of proving such a theorem, which is known under the name Tats barycentric embedding. So if you are able to draw your graph properly, and you are always <coughs> able to draw your graph properly, where proper means that both coordinates are martingales, then you are really in business. Because then you can use martingale central limit theorem. You know that, <coughs> okay, effectively what you get is that uh, there is a convergence to a Brownian motion, maybe with uh, non-trivial covariance matrix. Then you do a fine transform and you are there. So that's the same level of generality in the Eisen model. So somehow what I'm going to explain, <coughs> what I want to explain is a construction which is on the same foot. So which, given a graph, provides a good drawing of such a graph on which you can at least hope to prove convergence results for the Eisen model. And say in the periodic case, you really can do many things. Okay, not all the things I'm mentioning. I mentioned in the lectures, but yeah, that, that's really in a, good, in a good shape. Okay, and let me start with a reminder. So a reminder just first is, is basically from the first lecture. So in discrete, we have an alphabet. There are variables assigned to faces, those are spins. Then there are signs, well, they're not quite variables, but nevertheless, we have <coughs> correlations of products of mu's. They can be interpreted as true expectations if necessary. Then you can couple them, there is a variable chi. Okay, the basic <coughs> tool is just correlation functions where there is chi and whatever else. And then there is this trick, uh, chi, uh, chi itself, it leaves on a complicated double cover. Then there is a trick of multiplication by eta. And <coughs> moreover, what I told, I mean, what was in the exercises, is that on rhombic lattices in the Isaac Redal setup, 
there is a way to define a function on quads, like here, which is now <coughs> just some complex numbers related to the original observables by this, uh, by this <coughs> identity. And uh, <coughs> what is it good for? For instance, it is good for, I mean, the, the nice property is that uh, contour integrals vanish. Uh, I hope I'll have time to comment on this a bit more, but right now, let us leave it as it is. And they do vanish both on the dual graph as I <coughs> have drawn here and on the original graph if I integrate like that, they also do vanish. Okay. So that's a nice object, <coughs> uh, <coughs> provided we have a reasonable regularity statement provided we have a reasonable regular regularity theory for such functions. Okay, we know that all subsequential limits, uh, they are holomorphic functions by Marrera theorem. And uh, what, and then that's a question of identifying the limit. So that's what I'm going to, <coughs> to speak about. And at the very end of the last lecture, it was a construction of the function H as written. Uh, well, and right now I think about this function H as a technical tool. It's going to be of importance in the second half of the lecture. But right now this is just a technical tool. This is a real valued function defined both on vertices and faces. And <coughs> what is the magic? There is some positivity there. So magic is that H is <coughs> super harmonic, uh, sorry, subharmonic. meaning that the Laplacian is positive on vertices and the other way around, <coughs> super harmonic on faces. I don't tell you what is the Laplacian on isolated graphs. This is a weighted Laplacian. But let us just save time. Think about the square lattice. On the square lattice, this is just the, the average. On isoradial graphs, there is one very, very special Laplacian which approximates the continuous one extremely well, meaning that not only <coughs> the chord, both coordinates are martingales, just the covariance matrix at each step is a multiple of identity. So that's a wonderful approximation. <coughs> okay, <coughs> that, that's on faces. And the kind of a mnemonic picture is that uh, look, in this definition, the function on vertices is always greater than the function on faces. So somehow, you have such a couple of functions. So the one which is bigger is subharmonic, the one which is <coughs> smaller is superharmonic. So they really must approximate harmonic functions in the limit, at least intuitively. So it should be some boring technicalities, maybe, or maybe it shouldn't be. Uh, but conceptually, <coughs> that's the picture from where you should have an idea that already from here it should be possible to derive that H is harmonic too. Anyway, there is a maximum principle. So for such a function, for such a couple of functions, there is a maximum principle. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> let me formulate, so that, that was a reminder. Uh, now, <coughs> let me formulate some convergence theorems. Maybe what is the most important is not even the statement that something has a limit, but how the limit is described. So let me formulate two theorems. Theorems on convergence of observables psi z. And those are basically just two examples. I'm going to consider two very concrete situations. By situation, yeah, I mean what else is written inside of the correlation. And just explain what is the result. Uh, by the way, <coughs> you have definitions uh, just on the first page uh, under problem number one. Uh, the definition of the results. <coughs> so <coughs> what is the first theorem? Uh, again, remember the setup I'm working with is that I'm given a shape in a plane. Um, let it be simply connected on the blackboard, but this is not necessarily so. It, it does work in, for multiply connected domains. Uh, the generalization to Riemann surfaces is an interesting question, uh, which is 
not fully understood yet, uh, but at least to, to grasp some idea, well, there is a mixture of this type of arguments and summation over uh, homology classes on the Riemann surface. So, okay, well, let us stay in the, <coughs> in the plane. Multiply connected domains is already something on trivial, just if you are more topologically minded person. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> what I write, the round is the following correlator. So what is what? Here is one chi just sitting somewhere, maybe here. And here is one z. I try to use the same notation, the, the consistent, not, I mean to be consistent. So z's are always quads or centers of quads. So this is z. Okay? So <coughs> as a function of z, so this is this produces a real input. And as a function of z, this is something which satisfies discrete contours. Okay, we expect that the limit is a holomorphic function. And indeed, this is the case. <coughs> so what is what? First, I should rescale. Should rescale by, <coughs> by minus one. Maybe we'll see why minus one in a second. Maybe we'll not. Uh, as I mentioned, the most important, I mean, right now, there's just a statement, okay? Discrete holomorphic functions, they do converge to some continuous limit. Uh, what is eta, by the way? Eta is eta c. So c's are labeled by corners, okay? Each corner, it has some eta associated with. Okay? <coughs> now, what is f? And this f eta, this is a solution. <coughs> this is a holomorphic function. Uh, <coughs> so holomorphic solution <coughs> to the following problem. So first, it has a singularity at c. Namely, a simple pole, and the residue there is eta bar. Okay, still, well, that's the best way to, I mean, where we, okay, this is eta bar. And by the way, I forgot a multiple, but who cares? First over pi <coughs> in front. And second, there are some boundary conditions. So this is a function having a pole here and satisfying some boundary conditions. <coughs> and the boundary conditions, are uh, <coughs> the ones I already mentioned last time. At each boundary point, if this is a tangent vector, then <coughs> f is a positive multiple, is a positive multiple of tau to the power minus one half. So a bit weird boundary condition. So <coughs> last time when I spoke about determinants, regularized determinants, these boundary conditions, for instance, appeared as a boundary condition for the operator to be self-adjoint or anti-self-adjoint. So it looks weird, pretty weird, if you have never seen it before. Uh, but nevertheless, <coughs> okay, it is natural from several perspectives. Is there any question are there any questions about, about just formulation of the problem? Say again? Z is a quad. So faces like, uh, faces like are there, and Z is either an edge, an oriented edge of the original graph, or in this rhombic terminology, this is a rhombus. Right? Remember the Eisen model, it lives here. So the Eisen model, it lives on this graph. So those are in one-to-one -one correspondence with non-oriented edges of the graph, the same of the original graph. Okay? So <coughs> those observables chi, those variables chi, they are assigned to corners. They were here. And this magic definition, 
it assigns a complex value to the plot. That, that, that's that's the notation. Is that of rhombus? Yeah. Well, I should have yeah. I should have used rhombus. Yeah. But in a more general situation, it becomes just a quad, a quadrilateral. So. <coughs> okay. Here, it is just rhombus. Uh, other questions? Yeah, okay, what is the mode of convergence? Uh, the convergence is uniform away from the boundary and from the singularity. So this convergence, the, this whole small is, yeah, well, is at least point-wise, but also uniform away from, <coughs> from the boundary and C itself. Okay, and the first remark, uh, which might also justify a bit why this strange, weird boundary condition is, re I mean, might be relevant. A priori, it is not at all, at all clear that such a boundary value problem has a solution, right? And it's also not clear that the solution is unique. Okay. <coughs> As on the existence, in a simply connected domain, in fact, one can construct it by hand, uh, but also one can go the way around and say existence in particular follows from the convergence theorem. Because the convergence, the proof works like, okay, we claim that there is a subsequential limit and it satisfies this and that. So existence in principle follows, follows from the theorem itself. <coughs> and what about uniqueness? Well, that's just to, <coughs> to show a trick. So what the trick is, well, imagine there are two. Then I can subtract them and to kill the singularity. So what, I <coughs> what remains is just a function which is holomorphic everywhere inside and uh, satisfying these boundary conditions. So imagine there, is, there are two, so let me subtract them. <coughs> no singularity. And then what I do, I integrate the square of this function along the boundary. So just consider the integral along the boundary of the square of this function. Uh, right? Well, what the boundary condition tells me, it tells me that f squared behaves like one over tau dz is collinear with tau. So <coughs> it means this is purely real, just due to boundary conditions, okay? And moreover, it is real positive. Oh, sorry, sorry, by the way, yeah. sorry. There is no R plus there. I apologize because the square root is defined up to a sign. So to, to put R plus is, is a nonsense anyway. And there is no, <coughs> no plus there, so that's just fixing the complex phase. But here there is plus, right? Because say if it was a purely real number, then when I square it, is pos it is real and positive, okay? So that's a real and positive number, uh, but on the other hand, it must vanish, right? Because there's a holomorphic function inside. Oops, a simple contradiction. So it so happened that I integrate <coughs> a positive function and I get zero. Um, well, <coughs> okay, just a simple illustration that, uh, okay, this boundary condition, it is not bad. And <coughs> if you think about more complicated situations, like when f is not a function, like in this example, uh, but a spinner, uh, you should feel, okay, that, that it's not that bad because when I square, a spinner, this is a properly defined function, so tricks like that, okay, they, they remain relevant. Okay, but just an indication, I'm not going to, to go f really far in this direction. Okay, <coughs> so that's the convergence theorem. And uh, let me indicate, okay, wh what are steps of its proof before going further? Steps of the proof. I 
I'm going to, to comment on this. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, why there is no higher order pool? Yeah. I'm going to comment on this. So steps of the proof. <coughs> Basically, what you do is the following. So the first <coughs> remark is already made it, provided we know that functions. So what, what we are going to do, we want first to use a sort of a compactness argument. So just compactness argument, and I'm going to comment which, I mean, give more details. So, well, the existence of subsequent show limits. And then <coughs> identification of the limit. Okay, so provided we have compactness, we have subsequent limits, and then we need to identify it. So <coughs> let me first comment on the identification of the limit. So assume that we already have some compactness statement, and what we should prove is that whatever <coughs> subsequent limit solves this boundary value problem. Okay, so <coughs> to one. Holomorphicity. Follows because <coughs> contour integrals, contour integrals, vanish. That's not problem. Okay, <coughs> why no higher pole? That's what you ask. Why simple pole? Yeah, and the contour integrals, <coughs> the, just a comment, they do vanish, but not when you surround C. Because the contour integrals, that's all about this, this game with propagation equation, and when you are close to C, okay, something, I mean, some signs behave <coughs> badly. Okay, vanish. Yeah, that, that's, <coughs> that's here. So I'm not discussing compactness right now. So a simple poll <coughs> is actually, I like the question, and that's, that's a very good question. So why, <coughs> why there is no, uh, why can't be bigger, uh, higher order poll? Uh, just because this discrete contour stuff, it effectively fails at only one point. So imagine again, for harmonic functions, imagine that you know that your function is discrete harmonic everywhere except at a single vertex. What you can always do, you can subtract the green function at this vertex. And the result is harmonic everywhere. But you know that what you have subtracted, it blows up like a logarithmically. So in particular, <coughs> your original function also cannot blow up faster than logarithmically. Okay, so in continuum, there are harmonic functions which are mm, accepted at a single point which <coughs> behave there badly. Uh, but still, <coughs> um, in such a situation, you cannot obtain such limits. <coughs> so yet again, when you do <coughs> this function, like f z minus some f zero z, something concrete constructed in the full plane. Okay. Let me Go back. What, what was that? It was psi. Uh, psi z. Sorry. Minus something concrete. You have all contour vanishings. All. <coughs> Polymorphicity everywhere. And this is a sort of an analog <coughs> of the green function. So <coughs> you know how it behaves. In particular, sorry. FC. In particular, this correction behaves like one theta. Okay, that's why <coughs> it cannot be higher order pole. Very good question. And <coughs> two, three is what about boundary conditions? So why, <coughs> why <coughs> do I have such weird boundary conditions? So why boundary conditions? Well, here are some work. Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. <coughs> okay, <coughs> okay, uh, good question here. L let me clarify this. Again, imagine that we're working with discrete harmonic function. When I subtracted something under control, I now have a function which is discrete harmonic everywhere. And because of that, I have all the elliptic theory. I know that it is a priori regular, including the, the vertex where I patched. Okay? So that's not only <coughs> that what, what, what I wrote, that's not just all, con I mean, I insist on the fact that it is discrete holomorphic, and each time there is a discrete holomorphic function, there is a regularity theory behind something like that. Is it better? No? Okay, thanks. And what about boundary conditions? Here, a technical work should be done, but I indicate what is the, <coughs> I'm going to indicate what is the reason. And the reason is that in discrete, this function, magical function H, satisfies <coughs> Dirichlet boundary conditions. <coughs> and somehow, <coughs> if we already know that functions psi do converge, we should expect that functions H, they also converge to something. And H should converge to, well, as indicated, the very end of the last <coughs> lecture to the imaginary part of F Z squared DZ. Because in discrete, this is the magic of local computation. And okay, then what you say is that <coughs> if I have Dirichlet boundary, con boundary conditions for this function, then, well, I hope that I'm able to prove that this also has Dirichlet boundary conditions. And that's exactly what is equivalent to say, to say that. Actually, that's exactly the trick I used here. So the imaginary part, so that's purely real. The imaginary part vanishes along the boundary. Okay. <coughs> so that's uh, that's <coughs> how one identifies the limit. And yet again, <coughs> in a sense, <coughs> uh, this is the most useful part for the, rema for the remainder of the lecture because it justifies that such a boundary value problem is relevant. So somehow the relevance is just because you see exactly discrete versions of that uh, in the model itself. Okay, <coughs> just to comment, what is the compactness argument? Okay, compactness argument, some technicalities. <coughs> First, you say that if I know that function H is bounded on compacts, then okay, H bounded on compact, on the compact, on the set, then psi is <coughs> uniformly Lipschitz or Hölder even Lipschitz on compact subsets. Okay. As had been said during the first lecture, there are no analysts in the room. In the room. So, okay, probably uh, I shouldn't say any word uh, on that, but <coughs> if still there are, then, or people who do not hate analysis, <coughs> okay, that's a sort of regularity theory for PDEs, but you do things in discrete, something like that, at least a way uh, to think about that. <coughs> so just, <coughs> just a priori regularity theory. And then the question <coughs> is, okay, why do we know that the function H is bounded? Just because there is maximum principle and it satisfies Dirichlet boundary conditions. Wait, but if there is a maximum principle and satisfies Dirichlet boundary conditions, it vanishes and then everything vanishes. Well, if I am saying an absurd. Yes, <coughs> there are Dirichlet boundary conditions, but also there is a singularity. So effectively, the function H, it, is, it vanishes here and it blows up, blows up at the singularity. What you should do, <coughs> you should First, start, start with <coughs> H of this difference. 
Okay, now it doesn't vanish on the, bo at the boundary, but it is controllable there because f is under the full control. So this f is something which is, which, okay, on the square lattice it can be constructed by Fourier transform. If you wish, on either end of graph there is a trick. I'm not going, it can be constructed explicitly as well. Okay, so just prove a bound for such a function and then uh, there is a regularity for, for this difference and that's exactly an answer to your question. Why there is not only the residue vanishes but also <coughs> the, it can be higher or lower. Okay, I don't want to torture you with these details and I don't have time anyway so you're lucky. Okay, and now <coughs> I want to come back to these functions those themselves. The first problem is exactly to prove some simple statements about them. Uh, let me <coughs> okay. let me just <coughs> summarize <coughs> two things on these functions. So the first is that on these two things. <coughs> the first is that actually one can write this okay, one half, but here's one can write the dependence of eta explicitly. Effectively, what it, I mean, such an expression means is that this is a real linear function of eta. And why is it a real linear function of eta? Effectively, the proof is just above because, okay, the residue is a real linear function of eta. Okay, so there is such an expression, <coughs> but actually what one can prove is that just looking at this boundary value problem is that this is <coughs> anti-symmetric uh, and this is uh, yeah, I'm messing up the notation, by the way. Mm, okay. Well, it's fine. <coughs> and this is anti-symmetric with a conjugation. <coughs> there, but let me better, okay. It's fine. <coughs> so yet again, though, that's just an exercise to, to think about this this boundary value problem and uh, to prove such statements. Okay, now <coughs> what, what do I want to, <coughs> to say on this? So that's one. Okay, that's not A. <coughs> and two, that's again a corollary of the uniqueness statement. You can write what is the how these functions behave under conformal maps. So remember that's now the idea is that it should remind what I told you about energy densities and spins. So when you <coughs> apply a conformal map, here there are ZW, there are the images. Then <coughs> the rule is that this function, okay, it is symmetric, it is <coughs> holomorphic in the second variable, so it should be also holomorphic in the first variable, except the singularity. So this function is simply multiplied by the derivatives. And <coughs> if you put star, then, okay, some conjugation appears. Okay, that's formal tricks, but the goal is to push the story a bit to, towards to the conformal field theory. So now you can just say, okay, what are, what are field theories themselves? We should have an alphabet, which is there called fields, and we should have some correlation functions 
With mathematicians, we can think, okay, those are just functions of a number of points in a domain or in a full plane, and we should have properties of such functions. Okay, here, <coughs> this motivates a definition. So I can simply say, okay, right now it looks like another cadaver, but I'm just introducing a language. As I already <coughs> defined what are spin correlations and energy density correlations, at least in the simply connect, in the simply connected domain, I can simply say, okay, let me define this, <coughs> this sign in omega with plus boundary conditions like that. And similarly with, <coughs> with, uh, uh, now it's a mess. Uh, and no way to, <coughs> uh, to solve it. Okay, like that. <coughs> so <coughs> that's what is called free fermions. Th that's why the Ising field theory is called free fermions. So there are variables which anti-commute, which are holomorphic. So those functions are holomorphic in both Z and W. And there are anti-holomorphic components. So that's what <coughs> leads to, to this motto, which you hear each time you speak with a physicist on the Eisen motto. So this is a free fermion, okay? Free fermion. And the word free means that the propagation equation is just homomorphisms. Okay, and there is no interaction. The, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, the word free means that <coughs> there is no interaction, that uh, if you write more psi's here, there is a Pfeiffer structure. Yeah, I apologize, I said that. But we shouldn't be surprised about all that because we saw that already in discrete, there is a Pfeiffer structure. So already in discrete, these chi's as I told, they eventually can be written down in terms of dimers, and for dimers, there is always a Pfeiffer structure there. So, okay, the global picture is that probably for all correlations of such a type, one can write maybe inductively some boundary problems like that, and just see all the required properties like this or, or anti-commutativity, where is, where is it? Uh, there, just a corollary of boundary value problems. And this would be a fully, absolutely complete construction of all the correlation functions. Okay, the message, at least to some extent, this can be done. <coughs> at least for fermions, spins, and energy densities, and so on and so forth. So the first problem out of two is exactly about, about that. So <coughs> now, <coughs> yeah, but let me check Z and change Z and W here. And here are the functions were functions of z. I mean, the second argument was more, was more relevant. <coughs> okay, so that was <coughs> the first example of what one can prove on convergence. <coughs> and just a the last remark, okay, yesterday I told about, I spoke about spins and energy densities. Uh, spins are not here at all, but energy densities, they're actually here. And just another definition, maybe. This is also <coughs> in the exercise sheet. The definition, another definition. One can define energy density correlations in continuum right out of these functions. In particular, one point, one point expectation is F star WW. Uh, I over two. Well, if somebody can check what is written in, in the exercises, uh, it would be helpful. Uh, well, some factor. <coughs> Uh, I hope I over two. Okay, good. Anyway, just because 
because everything is taped and you're <laughs> uh, anyway, this must be multiple of i because of this symmetry. This is a purely imaginary number, right? So it should be multiple of i because epsilon is just <coughs> is just a real quantity in discrete. Okay, so now <coughs> that was an example number one. And again, to, to, to give a hint about a more general picture, if you're just interested in energy densities, more or less here is the recipe. Because in discrete, you know that such correlators, they satisfy Pythian structure, so you define all the limits just by Pythian identities, and you are done. So you, you, have, you have the result I mentioned yesterday for energy densities. So it basically, <coughs> it follows from this convergence, more or less. Up to the fact, so you ask the cl clever questions, clever question on what is the mode of this convergence, up to the fact that for F star you should enforce, I mean, <coughs> you should put it also at singularity. So F star doesn't have any singularity, so you, sh you should somehow strengthen it. I mean, to, to, yeah, to prolongate it to, <coughs> to the vicinity of singularity. Okay, and the second example of boundary value problems, now I <coughs> want to go, I mean, to discuss a bit what about spins. Or spins, that's a more complicated object, so the exponent is non-trivial, this one over eight. Here, the exponent for the epsilon is one, for psi is one half, okay. At least it's more or less visible how it appears. Uh, but what about one, one over eight? <coughs> and here is another theorem. <coughs> Again, <coughs> the most important is what is going to be the boundary value problem on the right. So now I have, again, a function which is discrete holomorphic. I put, I, VU. <coughs> I put one disorder at V and the spin at U, and that's exactly what was discussed yesterday in the full plane, right? It was one disorder, one spin, and the variable. Okay, that time it was chi, but conceptually there's this <coughs> there is no big difference. Still I normalize it. And this normalization well, I hope you also see an analogy with the full plane computation because what we computed there was not the correlation itself, it was a ratio of something. At the end of the day, uh, the output was the ratio dn plus one over dn. So, okay, this normalization is not that unnatural. That's like the full plane observable is already normalized by dn. Okay, there is this factor. By the way, <coughs> I promised to say why delta minus one here? Just because when we think about contour integrals, uh, the contour integral is the result of a local mismatch, and it is multiplied by delta, which is a uh, mesh size. So to have a non-trivial contour integral in continuum, we should rescale back. Okay, here delta minus one half is <coughs> slightly less trivial, but let us <coughs> let us take it for granted. So this converges to. <coughs> some function which I denote like that. <coughs> okay, wh what are the properties uh, of this function? First, this is a spinner, right? Because already in discrete, this stuff branches around, right? Like yesterday. So this is actually <coughs> okay, uh, second boundary conditions are the same. So at the boundary, this is exactly the same condition and it's again visible in discrete because the function h, the fact that it is constant is just local considerations. Okay, boundary conditions. Okay. 
Then what happens at singularities, at branching points? And there it blows up, but in the smallest way possible, similar like here. So what is the smallest way possible? <coughs> or slowest way possible? <coughs> the point V. This is a singularity of that kind. And again, <coughs> this is <coughs> in the exercises. Well, this factor, well, that's a matter of life. It is there. So you might think, okay, but that's probably exactly the same factor which was introduced in the notation for eta. Yes, but what if we drop it there, then the boundary condition changes. And it is not that nice to, <coughs> to speak about the symmetry between the, plane, the half plane and the full plane. And what happens? <coughs> at u, at the other point, well, this is now plus. So that's like multiplied by i. And c is an unknown real constant. <coughs> Frankly, the, this, this looks really weird again. But again, there is a message. Such a boundary value problem is again well posed in the sense that the solution is unique. And existence. Right, but that's near a different point. I mean, that, that, that's, this is the same function, right? G, V, U, Z. But that's asymptotics near, near V versus near U. <coughs> okay? <coughs> so here, let, let, me, <coughs> let me erase that. No, no. <coughs> Is there anything? Yeah, may, maybe I'm going to erase this. So that's a, those are boundary conditions <coughs> to keep. Oh, and here it was a domain. Because I want in 10 minutes, I mean in five minutes to make a similar, uh, <coughs> I mean to draw parallel with, <coughs> with this conformal covariance. And again, the first remark is that <coughs> such a boundary value problem is well, is well posed. So remark. Uniqueness of G. Well, <coughs> exactly the same proof <coughs> as it was here. If there were two functions, then I subtract and subtract and I kill the singularity here. So just take the difference. Then integrate g squared, which is a spinor, but squared is fine, dz over the boundary. <coughs> As I already said, this is always a positive real number. On the other hand, this must be 2 pi i u to Cauchy residue at u. So <coughs> here it is not cancelled. But it so happens that <coughs> what? That this is i c squared. So this is minus 2 pi c squared. And again, whoops, there is a contradiction with signs. Uh, yeah, just stay, consider it as a simple proof, just, just <coughs> to be convinced that uh, the, <coughs> the right-hand side is well defined. This is an interesting question to, 
speak about is there any deep meaning in, <coughs> in all that? And uh, well, uh, yeah, the, that, yeah, that's deep meaning is in the monodromy story, but yeah, again, I should confess that <coughs> I cannot really say it fully rigorously. But yeah, that's, <coughs> I mean, wh why, why, why exactly these conditions? Okay, anyway, the function G is well defined, <coughs> and now. What I want to do <coughs> I want <coughs> maybe first write what is the covariance of G and then erase that picture. <coughs> so with G actually everything is fully transparent. That's again an exercise to check <coughs> to check what is the covariance of G. And that's again one half. <coughs> if I think about my function in, the, in that domain, let me put it here in the print to indicate that <coughs> I'm now there. Then this is just a multiple of G in omega uh, up to phi prime one half. <coughs> and now here yeah, I can erase that and continue discussing it here. <coughs> the reason is due to the uniqueness. Because actually I can check that this solves the boundary value problem for that. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> what next? <coughs> uh, let me now. <coughs> okay, that's still not spin correlations. Right, I claimed convergence of some observables, some correlation with psi z, but that's not what I'm interested in. Again, let us try to think what happened yesterday. So yesterday it was a branch and branch, and the key information was encoded right near the branch. Dn plus one lived right there. Okay, <coughs> what one should do one should understand what happens with these functions exactly near the branch. So, okay, I'm going to, okay, okay that's a kind of corollary, which <coughs> in fact is, a <coughs> is of the same level of difficulty as the theorem itself. So that's also a difficult statement. Uh, <coughs> uh, what does it tell? It tells that Okay, when I do <coughs> one step, so well, when, <coughs> so if it was say v, and here there is u prime, okay, w one, w and w prime, <coughs> then for this uh, for this picture, I can find a ratio of this over that, <coughs> and it is related to what, well, but well, that's, that's rather a complicated construction, but we're, we're very close to that. So let me, this boundary value problem, it has a unique solution. So let me just <coughs> denote the next coefficient like that, like calligraphic A. So this calligraphic A, okay, there's some quantity, and you have a definition in the problem set. Okay, <coughs> so the message here is that it, <coughs> it can be expressed in terms of this A, B. 
So the first term here is one. The next term is up to some factor and up to some real or imaginary part is A, and then there are smaller factors. <coughs> Here is either real imaginary part, some projection, better to say, some multiples. But the idea is that <coughs> A is the quantity that really governs what happens when you change, when you move one phase. And the corollary <coughs> of this corollary is the following. Let me formulate it in the full general, I mean, in the full generality for two spins, is that <coughs> oh, you can control what happens <coughs> when you move the points inside of the domain. So in particular, this converges, as delta tends to zero, to the primitive exponential of the primitive of the following form. So you integrate in both variables <coughs> here and there, real part of A uh, VU dV plus A UVD. Again, you have this definition just printed. <coughs> so somehow <coughs> what you have is not the correlation itself, but you have a full control of what happens when you move points. So that's, <coughs> that's the picture. And <coughs> The comment on covariance <coughs> is that, okay, A is defined through G. So it should be an issue of calculus one to compute what happens with expansions near the point Z. And the message is that the covariance rule for A <coughs> looks like that. So this is A, D, U, uh, la, la, how do we round? Yeah, and by the way, here also, how do we round? Oh, sorry, it was a long week already. <coughs> All right, sorry. was B, and that was U. <coughs> and what is I mean? Of course, <coughs> phi prime is just the inverse of, <coughs> uh, sorry, of uh, phi minus one prime, but everyone should be careful. Plus something. Yet again, that's just calculus one. The Taylor expansions near <coughs> near the singularity. So when you integrate this form, this is invariant. So this is, this, I mean, the primitive of this is just the primitive of that. But this is exactly what produces the covariance 1, 8, which should appear. So that's exactly what produces the scaling exponent 1 over 8 from this perspective. Again? Good question, I don't know. Uh, I never checked, so 
Uh, yet again, for me, the Panlevia story is not something that I ever did. So I know about it, its existence here, I apologize. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but I cannot say much. Uh, what actually A is? I don't know. Um, I would doubt, but actually, because that's more or less. Now, A itself, well, okay, I, no, I don't know. Can't say anything on the record. <coughs> Again, <coughs> maybe just a conceptual remark now. So the message <coughs> of this part is that the exponent 1 over 8 can actually be derived from the construction in continuum. So before it appeared like a result of an explicit computation in the full plane. But <coughs> at the same time, this is just a corollary of some Taylor expansions near singularities purely in continuum. Okay. Uh, now, let me spend maybe five minutes on more comments on CFT, and then, <coughs> and then we move to more general graphs. Just last 20 minutes, it's going to be <coughs> kind of an addendum uh, to this story, which is more of combinatorial again or probabilistic viewpoint. So, <coughs> what is the CFT formally? <coughs> well, <coughs> as I already said in words, we have some alphabet, basically fields. In our example, something like that, maybe like that, epsilon. Etc. In principle, there are not in principle. In reality, there are infinitely many because, say, think about what epsilon was. Epsilon was just a product of two spins. You can think about higher polynomials, higher order polynomials. Like I take a bunch of ten nearby spins and I compute a complicated quantity of them. I want to <coughs> to understand what are correlations of this bunch sitting here and the same bunch sitting there. Okay, <coughs> then some, okay, correlation functions. So this alphabet is just to say that, okay, there are correlation functions. And it's really a sketch because the key element of the field theory is the stress and tensor and I'm not going to, to, to mention it at all. Uh, okay, <coughs> but then what is important is that uh, there are fusion rules or operator product expansions in the other terminology. <coughs> so what is that about? That's actually <coughs> the content of problem number two to prove one of them. So what I'm going to say right now, I want to explain just what it means. So the shorthand notation is like that. And I'm going to give it precise, to give a precise meaning to this notation. So it means that each time inside of the correlation, I have two spins sitting nearby, and I wonder what is the, <coughs> what is the behavior <coughs> near singularity. So I assume there are no other letters. So just this one. So as one point approaches another, I should have an asymptotic expansion that, that's an infinite series in principle. Uh, not in principle, okay, that's an infinite series. <coughs> uh, with terms, okay, like written here. Uh, 
yep. But that's right now this is fishy because this is just constant one. Yep. So in the easy model, that's exactly the alphabet we had. That's the point. That we know for this for letters, we know what are correlations in discrete. All right, very good question. Thanks for asking. Right, yeah, yeah, right, right. Actually, <coughs> that there, there are two possible levels. An ideal level would be just to think about this sigma in continuum as a random distribution, a random Schwarz distribution. For a sigma, this is possible. For epsilon, already this is, I mean, the higher scaling exponent is, the more problems you have. Already for epsilon, nobody knows how to do it as far as I understand. But definitely, <coughs> if, the, if the exponent is very high, well, the only hope is a kind of very involved, I mean, subtraction procedure of divergences, and that's a mess. An easier way <coughs> to think about that is just to think about correlation functions. So that's convergence theorems I mentioned last time. That each time I write a correlation in discrete, it converges to some quantity. Okay? And for that, for this four, we exactly, we know what they mean in discrete. So somehow, the formalism of a field theory is something very, very general. And this is a concrete example, which can be understood just by hand. What is going on and the proofs can be given. Okay, it's better now. Here, <coughs> but what I'm saying, <coughs> I mean, the, up to here, this is just a notational question. I mean, I just introduced some alphabet and I introduced some words in this, in this language, if you wish. <coughs> the interesting part pops up here. Oh, okay, <coughs> so what happens near singularities? And if we are in discrete, that's basically what we should, what we should expect, right? Because sigma, remember, remember how epsilon was defined. I should regularize somehow the product of two nearby spins, just subtract a constant, and then it was epsilon. So the whole <coughs> story for, for the next five minutes is to understand what I'm writing, why, what is the translation of this to a rigorous statement, okay? So I want to write <coughs> something like that, but right now it looks like an absurd, because this is constant one, and this when two spins are very close to each other, probably this should blow up, because there is a scaling, exp scaling, scaling rule there. Okay, I should compensate it. So here <coughs> is the blow up which compensates the scale. <coughs> but now, okay, so in this one quarter just comes from spins. This is twice the scaling exponent of sigma. Okay, but now <coughs> if I just leave it as it is, then uh, still a problem because these scales, when I delay and when I <coughs> when I <coughs> when I multiply, I mean when I just put a factor of two in front of the domain, right? And constant does not. So again, I should scale it, and the exponent, well, is one because this is the scaling exponent of the energy density field. So here there is one, and this one. Just comes from here, and so on and so forth. Okay. And there are more complicated terms. Well, I don't have to discuss all this, but just to, to, to give you an idea <coughs> of what's going on, the very last question in this formula is why one half. You might remember that I mean, is, there a, is this a meaningful statement or not a meaningful statement? Because you might remember in the definition of epsilon, it was a multiple that in discrete that I have chosen almost arbitrary, right? I mean, I just wrote something. Why not to multiply this by two, so as to kill it? So that's a question of the normalization. <coughs> uh, but <coughs> how this normalization, multiplexed normalization of epsilon, is fixed? It is fixed just by the behavior of that, by the, by the, 
uh, by <coughs> saying that, okay, what happens when I multiply epsilon by epsilon, when I consider a correlation of two energy densities nearby? It should scale like the distance to one over two because there are two epsilons, okay, that, that's the scaling law. And effectively, <coughs> what I insist is that there is a coefficient one here. The same as I insist here there is a coefficient one over u minus v1. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. <coughs> okay, so this one fixes the normalization of epsilon, and this one half becomes a meaningful state. That's what is called a structure constant in the corresponding algebra. Yep. So problem number two is just to prove this expansion. To prove it, you sh do not need to understand what the conformal field theory is because <coughs> both left-hand side and right-hand side, uh, they're just defined through this boundary value problems. It's just some manipulations, no, 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 not complicated actually, manipulations with solutions to, do, to them. Uh, but the idea is just to illustrate that there is a rich structure behind. <coughs> okay. Are there any questions on this PFT story? Yeah, and this <coughs> holds actually with uh, whatever, I mean, this should hold, yes, thanks for asking. This should hold not only for two point correlations, this should hold inside of all the correlation functions. So I can write whatever, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, <coughs> I can write whatever other fields here. Oh, here, oh. And the same rule holds. So this really leads to very, how should I say, constrained, I mean, to, <coughs> to really a set of powerful conditions on these correlation functions. And yet again, well, this is not exactly the derivation, but just an idea, just starting with such constraints one can derive these exponents. So just if you want a bottom line of this story, uh, just two sentences. There is a formalism of the conformal field theory. You make assumptions, like I have five fields in my theory which are named alpha, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera. They satisfy this and that fusion rule, fusion rules. Well, better to say something about stress energy, but okay, some conditions. <laughs> and then just algebraically, some representation theory appears, and this representation theory gives you as an output some quantities, some numbers. And those happen to be uh, scaling exponents of, of the fields, so, which is they're a quite remarkable idea because remember, we just started with combinatorics. I mean, with just stupid things counting contours. And then, whoops, all that. <coughs> okay. No, in principle not, so, <coughs> so that, that's really a long story, but say for a sigma, what I assume is that, no, that, that's the other way around. Logically, that's totally different bit of information. So that's uh, the fact that scaling limits of lattice models should be conformal, conformal field theories is just an independent logical step. Mm, it's hard to prove. Typically, so we do not have other good example mathematically understood rather than the Eisen model. So in the Eisen model, this is this is really in a very good shape. Uh, but for other models, we <coughs> we cannot cannot prove it. Nevertheless, if we start with the assumption of conformal invariance, 
if we start that, okay, we believe that the limit is conformal invariant, and uh, to believe in that, at least you should believe in scale invariance and rotational invariance. And then it is also on the physical level, so it's almost a theorem that it must be conformal invariant to two dimensions. Uh, <coughs> uh, then you have another tool to study your model. So exactly, that's an inverse logic. So what I said about algebra is that this is exactly what allows you to compute these exponents, model the assumption that the limit can be described by, by, by CFT. Okay? It's better, I mean, the, the logic of this work. <coughs> yeah? No, I, I would say here that's a matter of terminology. Uh, so that when you say conformal invariance of the model, uh, so on the level of correlations, you say that okay, correlation behave, correlations behave nicely under conformal maps in the limit. Okay, I'll discuss later. Okay, and now very short conclusion, like 15 minutes, on well, what about more general graphs? What about other graphs? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> what I'll tell you is just how it works in the periodic case. So assume we have a periodic graph. Which means that uh, there is an abstract planar graph, which is periodic weighted planar graph, which is periodic in two directions. Maybe like that. Looks like a square lattice, but okay, slightly more complicated. I mean, the full plane, so that's, this is the fundamental domain. Here is a graph. Okay, and there are weights assigned to every edge, which are repeated periodically. And the question <coughs> one might wonder about is, okay, can one generalize <coughs> all these convergence results to such setups? The first, the very first uh, question to ask is, what is the criticality condition in this case? Okay, <coughs> there is an answer. <coughs> Which is algebraic and, <coughs> well, I'll just write it. Uh, like that, very briefly commencing what is what. <coughs> so <coughs> those are E's, uh, even subgraphs on the torus. So those are even subgraphs on the torus. And this is homology type, so easy to. So when you think about <coughs> even subgraphs on the torus, for instance, this is an even subgraph. This is an example. And it has uh, type one zero. Okay, it crosses this edge, it doesn't cross that. Okay, so this is an example <coughs> of a graph. <coughs> Okay, some algebraic criticality condition, and to have an idea from where it 
uh, appear. <coughs> From where does it appear? Uh, well, the worst this story, remember about infinite volume limit. It was integral over the torus of the logarithm of determinant Samson. And that's exactly the same story. So that's the condition that the spectral curve touches the unit torus. Okay, so now we have an algebraic condition which does not, <coughs> doesn't know anything about the embedding. And the question is, okay, but how to embed the graph? And now, just a remark here. <coughs> well, <coughs> in the road, so first remark just here. Uh, what is the reason that H is well defined? The reason is that each time x satisfies propagation equation, this function is well defined, right? To define this function, we do not need any embedding. So the function h is something that can be defined purely combinatorially. Okay, and remark, not visible probably, is that on rhombic lattices, eta c and eta c blur, they do satisfy propagation equation themselves. That's just a check, right? Propagation equation, something about sines, cosines, okay, that, that's a simple, simple check after all. But it hides the, the, this, <coughs> this fact, it hides <coughs> the whole idea. So in fact, what this <coughs> criticality condition is equivalent to, it is just equivalent to the fact that there exists, there are two periodic solutions, solutions to the propagation equation. <coughs> In the isoradial case, those solutions are just real part, okay, either eta and eta bar, or real part of eta and imaginary part of eta. And this story <coughs> is purely algebraic. Okay, now a recipe. We are interested in a good embedding of a graph, and it should generalize rhombic lattices anyway. So, but what was eta? Eta, roughly, it was the square root of v minus u, right? Well, up to conjugation, up to multiple, but, okay, roughly, it was <coughs> the square root. But that, <coughs> there is a straightforward idea. Okay, once I already <coughs> understood that, that at criticality there are always periodic solutions to the propagation equation, let me use them to embed the graph. So, <coughs> the construction of S embeddings <coughs> is, just the is just the same lemma written above. So I take a periodic solution and I define a function analog of function h, which is now complex valued, not real valued, just by <coughs> declaring that, okay, S V minus S U uh, should be <coughs> X1 plus I X2 squared, where those X1 and X2 are just periodic solutions here. Okay, well, don't have much time to speak about that, but still, <coughs> there is some time. <coughs> so yet again, the very fact 
of, <coughs> of the very idea of this definition is exactly the same idea. Is that the propagation equation guarantees that one can somehow integrate x squared. And there are periodic x squared. So what, are <coughs> what is the geometry of this embedding? Well, this leads to tangential quads. <coughs> That's exactly the picture you saw during Mariana's talk. Something like that. And here is Z. So geometrical, <coughs> you have tangential quads. Again, so it looks like this was a black triangle and this was also a black triangle. And this <coughs> corresponds to the bijection with dimers on the bipartite graph. <coughs> okay, then you can wonder in this particular case, is there any hope to generalize definition? And the answer is yes. There is always, I mean, I can develop exactly the same formalism with observables chi and psi and, and so on and so forth. And there is the same formalism. So there are values psi such that projection of psi over eta is what <coughs> is eta chi over, okay, if this is C, let this be delta C. So now we do not have a single mesh size anywhere, but okay, at least locally we do. So now this delta depends on the corner we, we are, but the structure is the same. So you, there are many, many complex values written here and there. And <coughs> This one has the same projection onto some line as the print. So if this, oh, sorry. <coughs> if this is C, then projections of these values, they do coincide. And one can play with discrete contours again. And uh, what I want <coughs> to conclude with <coughs> is the following message. Is that the analysis techniques become more complicated. In particular, those contour, those contour integrals, they do not vanish anymore. But they do vanish approximately under some conditions. And what, is <coughs> what are the conditions? And the condition is the following. The contour integrals does not vanish exactly. <coughs> Which is a bad sign, but a good sign is that they do approximately. <coughs> but do approximately. Provided the origami map you have seen <coughs> an hour ago is bounded. Okay, it's, it's, it's periodic. By periodic, you should think, okay, bounded small. What is the origami map <coughs> in this picture? So, in this picture, Everything is relatively well visible because all those guys are bisectors. 
right? When I fold this edge and that edge, they, they really overlap each other. So there is a line, line. Every edge of a quad is folded onto this line. And here are some z's. Okay, something like that. So there is just line, <coughs> and here there are some z's. <coughs> of course, one should wonder, but is it possible to fit this condition? And this is exactly related with the fact that I cheated here. Because I said, okay, there are two solutions, x1 and x2. But how should I pick them from the two-dimensional set of solutions? Right? Those are solutions to a linear equation. Why shouldn't I take here instead of x2 just x1 plus x2? I mean, it should be some choice in this two-dimensional space. And that's exactly <coughs> what fixes the choice. Chosen so that is periodic. And there is a unique such a choice after conjugation and scaling. <coughs> so <coughs> the message, long story short, here are some discrete analysis leaves. This is the canonical black box procedure which starts with an abstract periodic graph and returns you a periodic picture like that. And the ambiguity of the choice of x1 and x2 is fixed by this, <coughs> by this condition, which is required in its turn to, <coughs> uh, to claim that contour integrals vanish uh, in the limit. Well, okay, I hope you believe that one can then do analysis there. There are no analysts in the room, all right, but that's uh, <coughs> just to mention that there is such a structure. It also has some nice <coughs> algebraic uh, content. So please consult the paper by Marianne <coughs> Rikenian, Sanjay Ramasami, and Wayne Lime. So which is at the archive, which is about dimers. So there is a link with cluster algebras. Maybe you find it more interesting for, from your perspective. Uh, well, still there are many questions what to do in more interesting setups. Like if you are not periodic, maybe you have random environment. Maybe you have random map. It looks like, similarly to barycentric embeddings, there is a canonical way to draw this graph in the plane. If you expect that the Eisen model on this graph with these weights is critical in some sense. Okay, just many questions to understand how all that works in more interesting cases. And that's where I want to conclude. Thank you for your attention. Again? Oh. <coughs> well, that's like you take the correlation of chi c uh, with another fermion at infinity. But the point is that it is a complex valued function. Say, okay, probably you are a bit familiar with that. Imagine there is like, <coughs> well, the point is that there are two choices at infinity. So it's here. So that's why two solutions, if you wish. Because the propagation equation, it is a real equation. Each time you have a complex valued solution, okay, it means that the, the space of, the dimension of the solution space is two. Right, okay, twice bigger. <laughs> Then you're going to